Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Kate Clark LeMay. I am the acting senior historian at the National Portrait Gallery and the interim director of Portal, the Portrait Gallery's scholarly center. And I'm delighted to welcome you here. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's conversation, which is entitled Enduring Images, Enslaved People and Photography in the Antebellum South. This lecture will be presented by our guest today, Dr. Matthew Fox Amato, who is an assistant professor of history at the University of Idaho. Moderating the Q&A today will be Dr. Ria L. Combs, the Director of Curatorial Affairs at the National Portrait Gallery. And so if you're looking for this webinar by Dr. Matthew Fox Amato, you are in the right place. And I think that it looks like most people have joined, so that's wonderful. Again, feel free to say hi in the chat. Before we begin, we'd like to give a land acknowledgement. Although we are tuning in together uh, today from different places, we gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home in these places today. We also recognize the inherent flaws of portraiture. Since this nation's founding, who is represented and how one is represented reflects the country's flaws as well as its strengths. The National Portrait Gallery strives to present a more complete narrative, one that acknowledges the history of slavery, racism, and inequality in the United States. Uh, before we begin, I want to just say that we have great news. The Portrait Gallery will reopen to the public beginning this Friday, May 14th. So be sure to reserve your timed entry passes. And I'm gonna read you the website, so bear with me. Um, you can find it at npg.si.edu backslash visit. So again, npg.si.edu backslash visit. And so you can find your time entry passes there. And we are so excited to see you all back in the galleries. Uh, from the heart, I can say that. <laughs> we're really excited. Okay, so today we're so pleased to present um, this lecture as part of the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum in American Portraiture. We extend our gratitude to Susan Steinhauser and her late husband, Dan Greenberg, the sponsors for tonight's program, for their generosity, which makes this ongoing virtual conversation series possible. I will now introduce today's guests. Dr. Matthew Fox Amato is Assistant Professor of History at the University of Idaho. He published Exposing Slavery, Photography, Human Bondage, and the Birth of Modern Visual Politics in America with Oxford University Press in 2019. The book was the runner up for the 2021 Shapiro Book Prize of the Huntington Library Art Museum and Botanical Gardens and a finalist for the Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize, as well as the Association of American Publishers Prose Award. It has been reviewed widely, excerpted in Lapham's Quarterly, and in 2019, it was named as one of the advocate magazines must read books on race and hate. Dr. Fox Amato is currently working on projects about the visual culture of the presidency, iconoclasm in the Civil War era, and WPA photographs of formerly enslaved people. He received his BA from Harvard University and his PhD in history with a certificate in visual studies at the University of Southern California, after which he held a Mellon postdoctoral fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis. So we're really excited for Matt to present. Um, before he does, I also want to introduce Rhea Combs. She is our moderator, Dr. Rhea Combs, and we are privileged to have her with us tonight because we're especially excited um, as this week marks her first week 
with us at the Portrait Gallery as our new Director of Curatorial Affairs. So I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Combs as our new colleague. Um, Dr. Combs comes to the Portrait Gallery from the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, where she served as curator of film and photography and head of the museum's Earl W. and Amanda Stafford Center for African American Media Arts. Her most recent exhibitions and projects at the National Museum of African American History and Culture include the museum's inaugural photography exhibition, Everyday Beauty, Photographs and Film from the Permanent Collection, as well as Represent Hip Hop Photography and Watching Oprah, The Oprah Winfrey Show in American Culture. Before joining the Smithsonian, Dr. Combs taught visual culture, film, race, and gender courses at Chicago State University, Lewis and Clark College, and Emory University. In addition, she has independently curated film exhibitions nationally and internationally for the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in New York City, Black Pu Public Media, and Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. Okay, so wow, we have an awesome stellar lineup. I'm very excited. Let's now turn to the lecture itself. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Matthew Fox Amato. Okay, well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, I want to start by thanking um, Kate Clark LeMay and Jackie Petito for the invitation to speak here this evening, and Dr. Rhea Combs for moderating. I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm so grateful to be a part of the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum, which is a, a really wonderful venue for the history of portraiture and art and visual culture more broadly. Uh, tonight, I'm gonna talk to uh, you all about how enslaved people used photography in the antebellum South. Give me a second here, there we go. Uh, my talk draws from a chapter uh, from uh, my book, Exposing Slavery, uh, which examines the reciprocal influence between photography and slavery from the birth of the medium in 1839 to the end of the Civil War in the US 1865. It explores how this medium was used by white Southerners to defend slavery, abolitionists to mobilize oppo opposition, enslaved people to shape their social ties and identities, and eventually Civil War soldiers to envision racial hierarchy. Now I know that the idea of enslaved people in the South purchasing and using photographic portraits from the 1840s through the Civil War might be a little surprising. Um, but when we look at the broader written archive, we see stories, stories about enslaved black people engaging this new visual technology. Take for instance, a story from the life of James Presley Ball. A black abolitionist photographer, Ball remembered selling photographic portraits to enslaved people in a gallery very close to the Virginia State Capitol in Richmond in 1846. This is only seven years after the announcement of the daguerreotype. As Ball remarked, quote, Virginians rushed in crowds to my room, all classes, white and black, bond and free, sought to have their lineaments stamped by the artist who painted with the sun's rays. Although in my research, I haven't located any photographic portraits in public repositories that were clearly commissioned by an enslaved sitter, we can still learn much through written records, such as photographers' sources, slave narratives, and newspapers. These sources demonstrate that enslaved people purchased images from itinerant artists, kept photographs of family in their cabins, and even mailed portraits to family members after the internal slave trade had separated them. 
Fugitives carried images of family northwards along the Underground Railroad. Studying this cultural phenomenon reveals that enslaved people were not simply victims to early photography. Now in tracing this dynamic, my work builds upon the fine scholarship on photography and African-American history produced by scholars including Deb Willis, Rhea Combs, Sarah Lewis, Lee Rayford, Jasmine Nicole Cobb, John Stauffer, Darcy Grimaldo Grigsby, Sean Michelle Smith, Maurice Wallace, and Nell Painter. Today, I wanna ask what did it mean for enslaved people like those who entered uh, J.P. Ball's gallery in Richmond to buy and possess their own portraits? Particularly amidst the persistent violence and disruptions wrought by the internal slave trade, what role did photography play in shaping enslaved people's identities and social ties? As I ask these questions, I also want to consider a conceptual issue that this research has raised for me. What does it mean to study the history of portraiture without portraits? If we don't have the images, and this is I think getting to what Kate Clark LeMay was discussing uh, about uh, thinking about a more complete history of portraiture, if we don't have the images, how can we still move towards a fuller history of portraiture and art and visual culture more broadly? Uh, I've organized my talk in two sections. First, I wanna consider enslaved people's relation to commercial images before photography arrived to the US. And second, I'll examine the emergence of photography in the 1840s and 1850s, exploring a few stories that shed light on enslaved people's photographic practices. As I wanna to suggest tonight, enslaved people drew upon the image culture of the Southern marketplace to resist and endure the conditions of the slave marketplace. Before enslaved people began obtaining their own photographic portraits in the 1840s, they had actually spent decades observing their owner's images. <clears throat> when enslaved people entered the wealthiest master's homes, um, they entered virtual galleries and some remembered the pictures. As Daphne Williams, who had been enslaved in Florida, recalled, in her mistress's house, they had themselves, as she put it, painted in pictures on the wall, just as big as they were. She further remarked how the images were in big frames like gold, and they have big mirrors from the floor to ceiling. You could see your own self walk in them. Mirrors displayed in slaveholders' homes gave both whites and blacks the opportunity for self-actualization. Paintings, moreover, forged a common viewing experience. Yet the means for self-presentation within paintings, given their size and especially their cost, divided enslaved from free in the 19th century. Long spectators in the master's gallery, antebellum enslaved people also constituted an audience for religious images. Christian iconography served an important visual aid for the white missionaries who, especially after the 1830s, sought to convert and instruct enslaved people as part of a broader movement to preserve the peculiar institution by reforming it. At missionary gatherings, Charles Colcock Jones, an influential Presbyterian minister, this is in Liberty County, Georgia, uh, supplemented hymns and prayers with scripture cards. These cards were produced by the American Sunday School Union, and they were basically large posters um, that showed scenes ranging from Adam and Eve uh, to Noah's Ark. Uh, you get the Tower of Babel. Um, Jones portrayed a common ocular-centric disposition when he declared the usefulness of these images from his perspective. Sight, he argued, greatly assists the memory. So images are a tool of religious instruction within bondage, Religious imagery also served as a means to represent missionary work to outsiders. As you can see here on the screen, um, this is a stereograph made by two Charleston photographers, Osborne and Durbeck, um, likely in the fall of 1860. Um, and uh, they um, made it um, on Wabala Island, which is a sea island just south of Charleston. Um, 
there's a lot we could say about this image. One of the things I want to point out right now is uh, we see the photographers here, photographers here constructing a scene that stresses um, enslaved people, and we, we're seeing their backs here, that stresses their attentiveness to the crucifixion. In this visual environment, the emergence of the daguerreotype, which was the first photographic process, uh, dramatically um, altered enslaved people's relation to commercial visual culture. And this brings me to the second part of my paper. I, I want to explore how photography allowed some bonds people, and I really stress the some, this isn't an argument that all enslaved people had photographs. Some bonds people became practitioners, uh, not just spectators of commercial images. While the perception of the objectivity of photography led the medium to be adopted for a variety of purposes in the 1840s and 1850s, uh, we see in the United States urban photography, we see celebrity photography, we see news photography. In this context, the commercial portrait really reigned supreme. Scholars estimate that 90 to 95% of daguerreotypes were portraits. In the South, one could purchase photographic portraits from itinerants, as well as established studio operators in towns and cities. These artists sold photographs for much cheaper prices than paintings while a moder moderately priced miniature painting cost about $15 in the late 1840s. In the rural South, as I found in my research, one might find daguerreotypes for as low as $1. By the mid 1850s, as you can see here, photographers uh, across the country are advertising daguerreotypes for 25 and 50 cents. 25 cents was approximately $7 in today's money. By the early 1860s, artists everywhere sold a dozen carte de visite, that's a later photographic process, uh, for a dollar. Frederick Douglass was one of many who celebrated the democratization of the portrait, proclaiming that what, as he put it, was once the exclusive luxury of the rich and great is now within reach of all. Daguerreotypes were available for purchase across the South. Two factors suggest that urban enslaved people and rural enslaved people who were hired out in cities had the easiest access. The conditions of bondage in cities such as Baltimore, Richmond, and Charleston gave these people greater freedom of movement and more cash in their pockets. Photograph galleries, uh, think of JP Balls in Richmond, were concentrated in cities. One set of records from an urban gallery, this is in Charleston, as you can see on the screen, offers traces of the African-American consumption of portraits in the South. This is a logbook from George Smith Cook, who's a prominent Charleston photographer, and they would notate um, the people who came in um, to get their pictures taken. And right there in the center, you can see the note for black girl. Um, this is a one sixth portrait. Um, and so this is uh, yet another uh, kind of evidence uh, that points to black people in the South uh, during slavery. Of course, we don't know uh, the status of this person, uh, uh, but black people in the South during slavery uh, getting photographs made. The steady flow of itinerant artists also meant that enslaved people in the rural South had opportunities to purchase portraits. Take the case of John W. Bear, a former blacksmith who adopted daguerreotyping in 1845. Bear spent the late 1840s traveling throughout the Northeast and Upper South, selling images from Boston to Alexandria to Wilmington, Delaware and Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Bear arrived in Winchester, Virginia in the fall of 1847. While he began charging $1.50 for pictures, generally a cheaper price than one might find in cities at the time, Bear advertised an especially low rate for the local enslaved people. And here's what he says. 
In this place, I reserved every Friday afternoon for colored people. This seemed to please both white and colored. I also published that slaves would be taken for 50 cents less than others. This made me very popular with them. They came in droves to see me on their day. The white people all agreed that my plan was a good one, so much so that the owners of them willingly gave them time to get their pictures taken. And many of them came with them to see that they got good ones taken. From the fall of 1847 to the spring of 1848, Bear sold over 1,500 photographs in Winchester. It's unclear why local enslavers encouraged enslaved people to purchase portraits from him, though I think two scenarios seem likely. Owners might have seen this allowance as an extension of their supposed benevolence. Owners might also have seen it as a new way to control enslaved people's self-presentation and definition explaining why they supervised the portrait sittings, much in the same way that they had long taken it upon themselves to name enslaved people. But this much is clear. The mechanization of photography had allowed Bear, a blacksmith, to not only take up image making, but also to make portraits cheaply enough to cater to enslaved people. Daguerreotype ushered in a novel and commercial means for some enslaved people to visually self-represent. Photographs may have proven particularly important for enslaved people in the Chesapeake region as it became a primary exporter of enslaved people. A main entry point for African slaves in the colonial era, the Chesapeake hit an economic downturn in the late 18th century as decades of tobacco cultivation had sapped its soil of vitality. Masters and traders began selling slaves or moving with them to the expanding Upper South, Kentucky and Tennessee, as well as to, to the Carolinas. At the turn of the 19th century, various factors pointed slave coffles increasingly toward the Southwest. The invention of the cotton gin, the purchase of Louisiana, government wars against Native Americans, uh, all of this worked together to open up agricultural territory for white settlers who migrated to new states of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. In Virginia, enslavers and slave traders brought enslaved people to Washington, Richmond, and Norfolk, where they then shipped them by land and sea to markets in New Orleans, Natchez, and Mobile. In all, historians estimate that one million enslaved people were forcibly shipped from the upper to the lower south between 1790 in 1860. As I mentioned, it's proven difficult in my research to find photographs in public repositories that were clearly commissioned by enslaved people, but certain images raise compelling questions. Uh, take, for instance, this daguerreotype made around 1850 of Lavinia and Judy Telfair Jackson. Um, Judy on the right was Lavinia's grandmother, and they were both enslaved by Mary Telfair, who was a prominent enslaver in Savannah, Georgia. No records indicate who commissioned the image, but we do know from Mary Telfair's private letters that she had at one point offered to hire out Judy as a cook. This was in the 1840s. And here's how Telfair put it. Judy can be trusted with your keys at $6 a month, pay her out of it $1 every month for herself. It's quite possible in other words, that Judy had the means to purchase this image. And I should say more broadly, uh, though enslaved people as a social class were of course defined by extreme poverty Historians such as Dylan Penningroth have shown that some were able to acquire small amounts of cash through, through a variety of activities. These included selling fruits and vegetables from their gardens at Southern markets and um, uh, operating boats that transported people, um, uh, hiring out one's labor. For instance, in Upson County, Georgia, enslaved people could earn 50 cents uh, sometimes per day 
by hiring themselves out to local businesses. The point here is not at all to romanticize enslavement, but instead to make note that these practices of entrepreneurship by enslaved people made the purchase of photographs possible. Still, we lack access to those um, photographs today in public archives. We can only speculate, for instance, about the aesthetic elements within those images. But I want to suggest that this lack of extant images is not a dead end for our understanding of the relationship between racism, uh, slavery, and early photography. We might see it as a challenge that raises questions for us about how we do what we do. Questions like, what does it mean to study photographic portraits when we don't have the portraits? What does it mean more broadly to study the history of art and visual culture when we don't have the images? Rather than saying there isn't a story, maybe we can think about asking what sorts of stories can we tell with written sources? In my research, I found that written sources, while they um, bar certain forms of inquiry, actually open up other dimensions, especially the cultural practices surrounding early photographic portraits. Indeed, enslaved people engaged in a number of cultural practices, communication, identification, memorialization, and contemplation through photography. If we stuck to the visual archive alone, we might miss this dynamic intersection, this intertwined story of enslavement and photography. Take, for example, the story of Louisiana slave Stephen Jordan. When Jordan's master, who was also his biological father, went broke, Jordan was sold to a nearby plantation while his mother was sold to a New Orleans merchant. Jordan had a wife on a neighboring plantation, but his new master forced him to live with a new woman. This indignity led Jordan to run away. In his preparations for escape, Jordan forged a set of free papers from a free black man who lived nearby. He would use these, as, he would use these if ever caught, to get off all right. Yet in the crucial hours before his planned departure, it was not simply the practical words on a page that Jordan hid away. As he recalled, I took those papers and stowed them away in a secret place in my cabin, together with my mother's picture and my own picture, which was taken when we belonged to Mr. Jordan, my first old master, together with some old passes books and papers. Jordan did not elaborate any further on the origins or later uses of these images. We might suspect they served a practical function for him. He may have seen his mother's picture as a precious document that could help the dispersed family reconnect, uh, which in fact they did after the Civil War. But these images were surely more than just visual information to Jordan based on the care he took to keep both his mother's and his own image in this dramatic moment. They may have served as emboldening visions, images of dignity that Jordan sought to realize more fully by fleeing. Surely such visual mementos also shaped his own lived experience of time. He remembered how at least his picture was taken when we belonged to Mr. Jordan, my first old master. These images surely gave Jordan many things, not the least of which was a specific and material marker of a before and after amidst the uncertainties of slavery. Photographs in this case helped enslaved people remember family members severed by the slave trade as they simultaneously marked particular points in their lives. To be sure, enslaved people invested a landscape of hard-earned possessions with meaning, but the photograph was no ordinary possession. As historians have shown, enslaved people occasionally decorated their cabins with popular prints, 
Stephanie Camp has a great chapter about that in her book. They might convey their identities through hats and watches. They might find pleasure and dignity in their clothing. Only photographs testified, as J.P. Ball noted, as he pictured enslaved people in Richmond, to their lineaments. Go back to that quote. To their lineaments. By lineaments, Ball meant the distinguishing visual features of one's face. In the antebellum era, picturing the specificity of one's external form was a central goal of photographic portraiture, which theoretically aimed to reveal the inner essence of the sitter, and the face took on particular importance in this context. An ordinary photographic portrait, in other words, could be an extraordinary object in a slave society. It could testify to an enslaved person's individuality in a society that denied her or his full personhood. Perhaps the closest material possession to the photograph was the mirror. The prevalence and geography of enslaved people's ownership uh, of mirrors is still, I think, unclear, but scholars have shown that enslaved people in Virginia had been purchasing small mirrors from merchants since the late 18th century. Like small mirrors, photographs offered the capacity to enjoy and scrutinize one's own body. But what separated the photographic image was its aesthetic permanence and material durability. Uh, this is actually an abolitionist image that was taken in, in 1850. Uh, this was a protest against the fugitive slave law of 1850. Um, and I, I put it here uh, to, to give us a, a sense of the materiality of early photographs. The leather and wooden cases of daguerreotypes and ambrotypes the resilient metal of the tintype, which emerged in the 1850s, and the lightweight nature of the carte de visite, uh, which was a paper image that emerged around 1859 in the US, made photographs ideal for exchange in the mail or for safekeeping in one's pocket. Photographs, in other words, went beyond the practice of self-actualization that one might find in the mirror to offer lasting statements of selfhood. The durability of this image helped enslaved people such as Stephen Jordan to memorialize, to gaze upon family members amidst the brutalities of bondage. Slave narr narratives and rare letters suggest that bonds people sought the virtual gaze photography offered. One slave narrative, Louisa Piquette the Octoroon, published one such letter. Louisa Piquette tells the story of how Elizabeth Ramsey, her daughter Louisa Piquette, and Louise's brother John were separated at a slave auction in Mobile in the 1840s. Louisa was sold to a master in New Orleans. Elizabeth and John were sold to a slaveholder just outside Houston, Texas. When Louisa, this is the daughter, when Louisa's master died, uh, she gains her freedom and moves to Cincinnati, yet she continues to search for her mother for over a decade, in fact, until um, in 1859, she finds her, she finds Elizabeth, the mother, and writes her a letter. Soon, Elizabeth writes a letter back to Louisa. As Elizabeth concluded in her letter, I want you to have your ambrotype taken, also your children, and send them to me. I would give this world to see you and my sweet little children. Other evidence suggests that this was a common sentiment for enslaved people, separated uh, to be able to see one another while, se uh, while separated. Separated by sale, one enslaved daughter told her mother in a letter, I want to see you very bad and you to write to me. As with any person distant from loved ones in the antebellum era, enslaved people longed for the surrogate presence of portraits. But theirs must have been a particularly powerful desire since the slave trade ripped them from family and friends and put them into new communities of strangers. On occasion, enslaved people successfully used photographs to bridge the divide wrought by the auction block. Take, and I wanna tell another story now, uh, the story of John Quincy Adams, uh, who was enslaved in Winchester, Virginia, and who detailed an exchange of photographs on the eve of the Civil War. In 1857, Adams's twin brother Aaron and his sister Sally were sold away from Winchester. 
Adams related how he was especially sad to have lost his twin Aaron, recounting, if I could just die to get rid of my sorrow and distress, I would be satisfied. I could do no good, but suffer day and night for months and years. Adams would not hear from his sister again, but he did eventually regain contact with his brother, his twin brother, Aaron, who had been sold seven more times uh, before ending up still enslaved in Memphis. Around 1859, Aaron in Memphis wrote to his family and Adams told of the surprise he, his oldest brother and his father felt in receiving this letter. What a rejoicing time we had that Sunday, he recalled. Since all were partially illiterate, Aaron Adams's father and oldest brother, as he put it, could read print but not handwriting, they found a friend to read the letter and to write one back to Aaron. Soon thereafter, Aaron sent Adams another letter as well as his picture. The photographic consumption and slave sales occurred across the South. It stands to reason that the circulation of Aaron Adams's photograph was typical which is to say the exchange of slaves photographs mirrored the geographic thoroughfares of slave trafficking, reconstituting family ties over the same pathways that had broken them. And I wanna spend a, a few minutes now um, thinking about the cultural and visual context of slavery and what enslaved people's photographic practices might have meant in these contexts. Their photographic practices uh, uh, likely acquired significance in a slave society governed through practices of bodily control. Central to the maintenance of Southern plantation labor and life was a system of passes, curfews, and slave patrols. Planters relied on such measures to police enslaved people's mobility. Meanwhile, slave traders relied upon bodily restraints to move enslaved people. And their narratives, if you, read, if you read slave narratives, you see Bond's people vividly describing uh, the size, the strength, the placement of the ropes, chains, and collars that facilitated the transfer of human property across land and sea. Within this context, exchanges of photographs could have symbolized the, reasser the reassertion of some measure of authority over one's own body. For those who encounter oppression through the body, historian Stephanie Camp theorized, the body becomes an important site, not only of suffering, but also, and therefore, of enjoyment and resistance. Perhaps Aaron Adams was especially gratified to send his portrait back to his twin, John in Winchester, sold a total of eight times before he sent his image from Memphis to Winchester, likely enduring many of the degrading, degrading corporal experiences of the slave trade, Aaron Adams might have understood this action as a way of declaring some degree of control of ownership over his body. In a similar fashion, photographic contemplation, looking at these photographs uh, might have accrued additional power because of the surrounding visual regime of the South. Life in a society for enslaved people meant life in a society of surveillance and visual inspection. In fields and in white homes, enslaved people worked under the watchful gazes of masters, mistresses, and overseers. Solomon Northup highlighted such omnipresence and how it bolstered white authority. Northrop's master Epps, as he put it, whether actually in the field or not up on our slide, had his eyes pretty generally upon us. From the piazza, from behind some adjacent tree or other concealed point of observation, he was perpetually on the watch. In the bustling slave markets of the antebellum South, meanwhile, enslaved people experienced the degrading experience of being visually inspected. Buyers carried out physical examinations, routinely stripping slaves either down to the waist or fully naked. They were looking for injuries, illnesses, and the scars from whippings that they read as signs of rebelliousness. They were looking at skin color, seeking blacker slaves for field work and lighter skinned slaves for skilled and domestic work. 
at the market, Bond's people's bodies were often viewed closely and callously for their industriousness, reproductive potential, and sexual appeal. Amidst this surveillance and inspection, owners also demanded with great regularity that Bond's people gaze upon spectacular cruelty. Perhaps Frederick Douglass most profoundly articulated the effect of this violence when recalling the savage beatings of an aunt during his childhood, he described how he, as he put it, was doomed to be a witness and a participant. Douglas made unmistakable the unavoidable reality of bondage in which he lived his days as both victim to an audience of the lash. As he painfully indicated, masterly authority enlisted enslaved people as spectators of their loved ones suffering. For enslaved people then, image viewing could reverse the set of disciplinary visual practices that governed work, facilitated sale, and reinforced hierarchy. One wonders whether enslaved people valued how portraits visually removed their bodies from the mechanisms of exploitation, racial power, and commodification. For enslaved people, photographic portraits could perhaps emphatically point toward the person, not the property, as the case of Virginian slave Robert Brown illustrates. After his wife was sold to a slave trader, Brown fled to the North with her daguerreotype on his person. When he made contact with abolitionists on the Underground Railroad, as William Still noted, Brown revealed the image, quote, speaking very touchingly while gazing upon it and showing it. One might argue that such an image only furthered Brown's sense of loss over the separation from his wife or his fury about her continued enslavement. But it's highly unlikely that Brown and other um, enslaved people would invest their money in photographs if they did not find great value in them. Brown's photographic practices demonstrate how the portability of the photograph gave enslaved people a measure of control over how they looked upon their loved ones and how they showed their loved ones to others. If the portability of the photograph enabled the exchange of images and the preservation of family mementos, that same portability could even prove crucial to proving identity. For instance, the practice of photographic identification allowed former slave and Reverend J. Sella Martin to redeem his sister and her two children from slave traders in Covington, Kentucky in 1862. And here's how Martin described it. I had written to T.J. Martin, who is one of my earliest and most faithful friends, asking him to act as my agent in buying my sister and her children, as he had promised to take them into his employ, and he very kindly consented to do so. I wrote to him also, should he get to Cincinnati before me, to go over to Covington, a place opposite Cincinnati on the Kentucky side of the river, to where the traders brought my relatives, and get their ambrotypes, which is a type of photograph, so that I should not be cheated in buying others than my sister and her children. He did so, and when I got them, finding by the likenesses that those were the ones I wanted, there was nothing left me to do but to count him out $2,000 in gold, and he went over to Covington and made the purchase. So we see in Martin's case that a photograph could actually prove the identity of a distant loved one so that he wouldn't have to go into the slave states. He could um, instead use a photograph to identify them. These practices would aid enslaved people in keeping connections through the Civil War and into emancipation. When enslaved people fled during the conflict, they sometimes brought images of their kin northwards, as in the case of Thomas Sims, his family, and a number of other bonds people who took off from Vicksburg. The Liberator, which recorded the story of these fugitives, described how they, as it put it, brought them, I'm sorry, brought with them a few household treasures, keepsakes of friends, and daguerreotype pictures of dear relatives, still in bondage, but whom they, whom they hope soon to greet as free. Photographs thereby offered practical tools to find old faces. 
After the war, John Quincy Adams, who had been enslaved in Winchester, if you recall, kept in touch with his twin Aaron through letters and images. Receiving a portrait from Aaron around 1867, Adams described how you could not tell it from mine. In Aaron's picture, Adams saw time pass with two images of his brother, one from slavery, one from freedom, Adams could see his twin aging from afar. And I wanna wrap things up now. As, I, as I've tried to suggest today, enslaved people uh, were not passive victims, but rather active agents of photography as the medium emerged. This new visual technology enabled some bonds people to make their own unique visions for its cheapness and availability opened up commercial access. The portability and materiality of the photograph moreover gave some enslaved people new ways to communicate, identify and remember. It's difficult of course, given the paucity of sources left behind by enslaved people to estimate the extent, to the, uh, to estimate the extent of this cultural transformation. For some bonds people, however, photographs clearly mattered a great deal, especially in relation to the violence and disruption of the internal slave trade. Through private photographic portraits, they maintained social ties, memorialized loved ones, and withstood white supremacy. In the late antebellum era, enslaved people were photographic innovators. They turned photography into an important new resource of resistance and endurance. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, it was a real treat and pleasure to have you sort of engage us in these kind of new ways of thinking about uh, this early photography and particularly the ways in which enslaved persons utilize this work. It's really, I think, groundbreaking and important uh, information that you have shared with us. And so I, with the little, with the limited time that we have left, and I do know that we have some questions, I just wanted to um, sort of asked you to speak a bit about what I saw as an important phrase you used. So as I've stated, you're expanding the understanding of how photography has been used and sort of the power of the representation or the power of photography and, and, and its sort of representative modalities. Um, that stereograph that you showed us early in the presentation by Osborne and Durbeck uh, was really quite striking to me because we're talking 1860 and within the cultural imagination, you know, one often either has lithographs of, you know, enslaved persons in bondage that, you know, sort of were really kind of predominant within the culture, or you have broadsides that are describing people in such ways, but you selected that image and it was taken of these person, enslaved persons sort of learning, I guess, religion, right? Being taught a sort of a religious, in a religious moment and, and sort of at rest. And I thought that that was, or, or you know, sort of in, in an, in, an, in, an environment that s did not sort of show them in this sort of labored way. Um, and I thought that, that was quite a striking image. And I wanted you to sort of either talk more about either the, the proliferation of those, if that was a, a sort of a unique image versus, um, you know, is that something that's more common, commonplace that they would have these kind of stereographs and, and how does that um, sort of support these other ideas around agency that you then later talk about in, in the presentation? Yeah, that's a great question, thank you. Maybe I could paint a little bit of the picture of what the, the photography of slavery looked like in the 1840s and 1850s and into the 1860s. One of the things I talk about more broadly in my book is while enslaved people, uh, some enslaved people are studying to get their own portraits made, 
enslavers are also getting photographs of the people they owned made from both studios and itinerant artists. And we see um, them gated in their primarily studio portraits. Um, the cover image of my book um, mm. is, is one example of that. Um, we see individual enslaved people getting photographed. We see um, those interracial scenes, um, typically an enslaved woman holding a white child. And uh, particularly in the 1850s, um, enslavers, they're not only getting these photographs made, um, but they're circulating themselves amongst themselves. These are not popular, it's not popular, uh, it's, it's not popular culture, they're not getting circulated widely, but for enslavers and their social circles, um, um, they're exchanging these images and sometimes even using them as explicit defenses of slavery. So I'll give you one quick example. I, I write about um, uh, a white man from uh, an enslaving family uh, from a Charleston family. His name's Edward J. Pringle. He moved to San Francisco in the 1850s to practice law and one day writes back to his mother in Charleston and says, you know, mom, thanks so much for sending me pictures of the white family and thanks especially for sending me this photograph of Mac, who is an enslaved butler in a Charleston townhome. And Edward Pringle says that he keeps this photograph of Mac on his desk in his law office and shows it to everyone who comes in. He says, what a great representation of this, of our institution, this photograph of mm. Mac is. Um, so we're seeing the emergence of a kind of white supremacist uh, pro-slavery photography in slaveholding circles. Um, and in 1860, the stereograph that you mentioned, I think is an extension of that. Um, this is a more commercial image, but like the other images, I would characterize it as a pro-slavery image because it is removing enslaved people uh. from, from the violence, from the commodification, from these things that we know were central um, uh, to slavery. Um, I'm not, um, um, I, I'm, I'm not uh, 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 sort of uh, well-versed on, on the circulation of images. I've published an article about them. Um, uh, I, I think we don't really know yet how widely um, these Osborne and Durback images circulated. Um, and one of the points that I make in the article that I published about them is that um, if the South, if the Southern photographic industry didn't get decimated by the war, Mm -hmm. which is to say um, once the war begins um, and the North and the Union institutes a blockade, uh, Southern photography kind of, as, as you know, sort of dwindles away because right. they don't have materials. They don't have stuff to make their photographs anymore. Right, right. But if, they, if, if there hadn't been that blockade, I think we would have a, a big archive of those sorts of photographs from the Civil War. And yeah, I think that sort of kind of pro-slavery photography get short because of the kind of economic conditions of photography. But it's interesting that you're saying, because I'm seeing, you know, sort of human, sort of a human being as opposed to just sort of being, you know, um, this harsh labor uh, imagery. However, it is then used as propaganda to say that, you know, look, it's not as bad as people say it is. And, and that's fascinating um, as well. And uh, so I wanted to just, I think another sort of thought that came to mind for me is that these photographs, especially the portraits of enslaved persons uh, while important for them to keep as sort of evidence. And I think, as you said, material markers, uh, they also serve, I, I would Im imagine, as um, sort of, as we mentioned, the evidence that it was so temporal, the situation would be temporary. Families were constantly, you know, sort of snatched from one another and you didn't know when that would happen from day to day. So this becomes then as well, another sort of opportunity for that 
historical sort of memory and you know for you to have that evidence to make sure that you know that you're part of another sort of family if you will that your sort of uh family tree and how it has been sort of how this becomes a, a way of sustaining that over time irrespective of the circumstances that one might find themselves in yeah no i think that's that's a, a wonderful point and 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 i think there, there's something to, um, you know, why did they why did they want photographs? Uh, I think you're getting at the the anticipation, the, yes. the unknowns. You know, this gets us towards what was it like to to be an enslaved person? You know, the fragility uh, of it, right? The fragility of that sort of lived experience. Yeah, and so you you perhaps want a photograph of your family member because you know something might happen to them. They might get sold away and you'll have that document. And, and you know, one of the things I'm trying to stress is there's both a kind of imaginative a kind of memorializing function to the photograph so that, you know, kind of on a subjective level, you can remember the person and they, bec they become practical documents as the, as the Reverend J. Sala Martin instance mm -hmm. shows uh, to actually find people. Um, and so I think you're, yeah, yeah, I really uh, think you're getting at, you know, um, why these uh, were so important to them. It also is becomes a moment marks time in a way that you know otherwise the redundancy as we all all kind of have not to in our certain current circumstances people have constantly made the point of you know it feels every day feels very repetitive redundant and so when you have these um, evidentiary markers you can kind of Comp mark the moment in time at, in that way as well, in terms of the year or you know a particular month or something as well. Uh, we have quite a few questions and I'm thrilled to say that we do. And I would love to try and get to some of those with the time we have remaining. Does that sound fine for you? Um, I think here if, um, let's see, kind of going through here and I, I'm doing this without too much of a sort of trying to navigate asking questions and looking at what we have as well. Did slave owners ever have slaves photographed to make it easier to retrieve them if they escaped? Is that a question by Tara Ross. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And in my book, I write about one instance of an enslaved woman named Dolly who was owned by the Manigo family, which is a kind of very wealthy slaveholding family in South Carolina and Georgia and the Low Country. Uh, and other folks have written about this um, image as well. Um, it is, a, it is a, a paper photograph, a carte de visite, a portrait of Dolly um, that um, uh, when she flees the Manigo family during the Civil War, the enslaver, Louis Manigo, um, pastes at least two of those portraits. Uh, you can get carte de visite by the dozen. Uh, paste two of those portraits of Dolly onto want ads uh, and circulates them. Um, did he get that image in anticipation of her, of her fleeing? Uh, perhaps, perhaps. We don't have direct, I don't think we have direct evidence of, the, of that yet, but I think um, it is cer certainly something that um, enslavers uh, would have started to realize um, there's a long history of fugitive slave ads and usually it's a lengthy written description of the fugitive with a kind of stock image of uh, a man and sometimes a woman uh, carrying a kind of you know bag on a stick um, and so one of the things that we actually see Louis Menigo doing here is he's updating surveillance technology um, he's drawing on photography uh, to police enslaved people's movement and interestingly, in my research, uh, he's writing in private to different people when Dolly free, flees. And one of the things Louis Manigo says is the, he says the, something to the tune of uh, the likeness is very important in such instances. Um, and I think one of the things he understood there is um, there are many illiterate whites out there who he is relying on to help find Dolly who might not be able to read a lengthy written description about what she looked like, uh, but he knows that they can identify her through the photograph. Um, so that, um, like the stereograph uh, that Dr. Combs mentioned earlier, 
is, is one of the practices that we begin to see um, on the eve of the Civil War. Great question. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Could you talk a little bit? Uh, so Yvette Zavala, excuse me if I mispronounced that last name. Could you talk a little bit about the nannies as depicted in the image on the cover of your book that was not discussed in your talk? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 one of the kind of subgenres of pro slavery photography that you see in the 1850s of um, enslaved women holding white children, um, and this is part of the broader context of how enslaved uh, 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 enslavers used photography that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and and um, you know, you see a, a variety of of poses. Uh, they are taken uh, in different places throughout the South. That particular one is taken uh, in the mid 1850s in Charleston. Um, and that was, uh, again, an image that, that um, slaveholders um, were making, I think, both to kind of reassure, uh, for some, I think, to reassure themselves that what they do, were doing wasn't so bad, uh, as well as to kind of project um, an argument about slavery um, in their social circles uh, about slavery as a supposed benevolent institution. Um, all this is a way of saying that we can't treat these images as uh, some sort of documentary record um, uh, of slavery. Instead, we have to understand images as arguments. And I would, I would link those, um, uh, I call them chattel Madonna portraits in my book. I would link those images to um, the issue I was talking about earlier with the guy in San Francisco who said, these are a great representation of our institution. Um, uh, that's how I try to contextualize them in my book. There's so many incredible questions here. Uh, and we only, it seems like we only have time for one I, more according to, uh, <laughs> someone in the chat. Um, and so I guess kind of to try to combine one, I would ask, you know, do you have any sort of thoughts and speculations of where some of these photographs may have ended up since they're not in a lot of public collections? And were there some formats that you have found in your research were more popular than others? Um, and, you know, could the photo type help uh, in the analysis of speculating um, if the individual in the photograph was actually enslaved or formerly enslaved when the photo was taken. So trying to combine a few. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, this, this can be needle in a haystack research. And I think it's needle in a haystack research that uh, we need to do uh, mm -hmm. rather than simply saying, in, treating enslaved people as, as kind of separate from uh, photography. Uh, which they weren't, um, and you know, I I hope other people will continue on this research path. Um, uh, you know, Ele Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, uh, a great historian at Harvard, uh, mm -hmm. just published um, an image in a book called "To Make Their Own Way in the World," uh, an image um, that was passed down through generations uh, in her family. Um, that her family held. And so hopefully people will go and take a look at that image. That's why I stress I haven't found any in public archives because uh, I think there are some um, in, private, um, in private records and, and I hope more will come out and I hope we'll be able to, to research some of the many unidentified images, uh, photographs of African-Americans that are in the archive out there. Uh, the, uh, you know, I was just looking the other day, the Ralph Lindsley um, Simpson or Sampson collection at Yale. Uh, is this massive archive of African American photography, and we know, you know, I went through it. And we know so little about who's actually posing, um, and I think that that kind of work uh, will help us uh, continue to flesh out this picture. Wonderful. Well, I could talk to you all evening, <laughs> uh, and you know, from this the series of questions that are here, that I am really sorry that it seems like there would be others that would be interested in hearing you speak as well. But our time has run short, and uh, we will be sending you the questions um, that you uh, that you received, and hope that you get a chance to touch base if you so, are so inclined, or at least know what people 
um, had to ask and um, or what people were asking you. And thank you all very much for joining this evening. It, it was a delight and an honor to share this company with you. And uh, yes. I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Combs and Dr. Matthew Foxamato. Um, I just want, I had the unfortunate responsibility of, of like officially closing us down. Um, which is hard to do when, when there are so many great questions and such interesting material. Uh, I know that all of um, my colleagues and I at the Smithsonian, you know, we, we do debate a lot about what do you do when you can't find the portrait? Um, and so it was really interesting to hear Matthew's, you know, research, you know, go, go beyond the portrait, go into the archive. So it's something to think about for us. Um, I do want to do a plug for our upcoming program. Before ending, I would like to invite you to join us again on Tuesday, June 8th at 5 p.m. on Zoom for the Tommy L. Pegas and Donald A. Capocha conversation series in LGBTQ plus portraiture for, and this is the title, We Starve Ourselves and Each Other, Hunger and Lesbian Self-Fashioning in 1970s America which is presented, will be presented by Dr. Katie Anania, who is Assistant Professor of Art History at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And our colleague, Dr. Catherine Ott, who is Curator and Historian in the Division of Medicine and Science at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, will moderate the Q&A. So mark your calendars, Tuesday, June 8th at 5 p.m. That's about a month from now. Uh, we really hope you can join us and thank you everyone um, again for attending. Sorry, we went a little long, but it was really hard to, to interrupt. So thank you again and goodbye. Good night. Good night.